Hello everyone, welcome to the third and final event in the Bivalis series. This is part of the Liz and Bob Frankel Hiking and Environment Spring Lecture Series. Tonight's event is Local and Global Benefits of Protecting Beavers. My name is Bonnie Brzozowski and I'm a Public Services Librarian at the Corvallis Benton County Public Library. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to orient you to the platform we're using tonight, which is called GoToWebinar. And really, the most important thing is that there is a bubble with a question mark. It's usually to the right of your screen. And if you click on it and throughout the presentation tonight, you can submit questions or if you need to tell us anything, you want to submit comments, um, please feel free to do so that way. We will have a question and answer period um, at the end after we've heard from all the presenters. The library is very grateful to Dave and the Mary's Peak Group for bringing this amazing series to the community, and the library is really proud to be a part of it. So thank you, Dave. Dave Eckert, the program chair for the Mary's Peak Group, is going to tell us a little bit more about this series, um, as well as about our panelists. So Dave, would you like to join us on screen? Yes, if you want to let me share my thing, then I don't have to watch myself that much. Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me help you out here. There we go. Sorry for the delay. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Looking okay. good. All right. All right. Um, so welcome, as Bonnie said, um, in, we're in Bivalis, Oregon. And um, the, the whole series is called, of all three webinars, is called Opportunities for a New Beaver and Human Relationship. And this is a five foot tall, 50 foot wide beaver dam in Corvallis that wasn't there three years ago. And you can see our logo, logo of the beaver. Um, just a second, push the wrong button. Okay, this is part of the Liz and Bob Frankel Hiking and Environmental Spring Lecture Series. And we've been doing this for years, have a different theme every, in, every year based on hiking and or the environment. And Bob Frankel uh, was a renowned, he's a, passed away and he's a re, was a renowned wetlands ecologist and specialist. And um, Liz Frankel, was a renowned Oregon lobbyist uh, for the Sierra Club and for the League of Women Voters. And as a pair, they were unbeatable using science and strategy and political strategy to win over very big projects that we all take for granted in Oregon. Um, from wetland um, uh, preservation to the Jefferson Wilderness, so many projects that go on and on. And uh, Liz was my mentor. And uh, a lot of things I do are a direct result of what she had taught me to do and actually told me to do. Um, this uh, this pro whole series uh, honors the Ampanefu Kalapuya, whose land we are on. Um, and uh, this, you can see the area in white there uh, that includes Corvallis and Flomath and the Mary's River all the way up to Mary's Peak. And um, we um, will talk a little bit more about that in a second. The Mary's Peak group uh, uh, is of the Sierra, uh, the local group, group of the Sierra Club, and we try to inspire a culture that's engaged with flora and fauna and soil and water and geological features. Some people call it hiking. And I hope you have an opportunity to watch our damned video that we made called Damned Oak Creek. And it's on YouTube, it's only nine minutes long and it features this dam that we show you so often. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a unique video showing the difference between a human dam and a, and a, um, a beaver dam. And uh, all you do is go on YouTube and, and search for Damned Oak Creek. So please watch it. Now, I uh, mentioned Champanefu and the Ampanefu Kalapuya. Uh, our other uh, lecture and webinar series we uh, do is in the fall. And it's called the Champanefu Lecture Series. We uh, partner with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. And they, the Grand Ronde selects the, the topics, the speakers, and, um, and then 
Uh, we were uh, our collaborators and we actually managed the program and along with the library, just like this one is. And, um, and every year it's a different theme, different group of speakers and um, presentations. And this time we're uh, focusing on the confluence at Shawala Point that's in Corvallis. That was a very important uh, uh, cultural area and it still is. And unfortunately, culturally now in Corvallis, we're not treating it as such. And so the whole series of three lectures is based on the cultural, the tribal cultural interpretation of Shawala Point. And this webinar series, we had three. Um, I hope you got the chance to see this first one. If you didn't, it's recorded on YouTube. Just search for B. Vallis. I guarantee the only B. Vallis you'll find on there is um, uh, this recording. And um, that was a great one on what's happening in, in Benton County. And then the second one, I think, uh, Bonnie, that will be um, on YouTube, uh, if not today, within the next week. And um, that one, we had actually four speakers. And we're talking about um, special ways we can coexist, both in the ground, in the water, and legislatively, uh, if we want beavers to help us and to help and us to help them. And on this one, we're looking at both global and local benefits of protecting uh, beavers. And we're really honored to have three renowned speakers. We're very honored to have them and I'll go over them individually. Um, also, of course, we have our own Beavalis Oregon t-shirt now. We only have a couple left, actually, that haven't been claimed. So um, if you're interested, there's my email address. And so for tonight, I'm very excited to have Suzanne Foudy, who's a renowned hydrologist, spent her life as a hydrologist, and she's um, she's been exploring the issue of water in the West for the last 30 years. She's focused on the contributions made by beaver to ecosystems for systems for over 25 years. Suzanne um, was included in the PBS, PBS Nature episode, Leave It to Beavers, and featured in the film, The Beaver Believers. She was a key driver behind three recent efforts to close federally managed public lands to beaver trapping and hunting. And she worked feverishly to change our culture and our laws to allow beaver to do their life-changing water-related habitat work that could have positive impacts upon climate change and water availability. And tonight she's speaking specifically about water availability and water um, quality. Our second speaker is going to be somebody who just lives right up the street from me, Chris Jordan, who is a research fisheries biologist from NOAA and NOAA's Northwest Fisheries Science Center in what he lovingly calls a boring paperwork driven job. But on the fun days, he works on methods for stream restoration, focusing on beaver and process based thinking. He has become the go to person in Oregon when the media is looking for a beaver expert. And he has been working with past Bivalis speakers, Jacob Shockey and Randy Comalillo on Corvallis's Daniwi Creek, the first Benton County project to keep the beavers active and the county happy at the same time. Emily Fairfax uh, is, is speaking to us just from four, mile, four miles from where we used to live or my wife and I used to live in Camarillo, California. And she's and Emily is an assistant professor at the California State University Channel Islands. And she is also a courtesy adjunct assistant professor at the University of Colorado. Her research is based on eco-hydrology and on beavers as they relate to mitigating drought and wildfire and remote sensing. And her re, a recent paper she just did um, was a paper, um, I mean, with Chris Jordan, is on beavers and climate change, and it has really changed, uh, gotten a lot of scientists' attention, and hopefully that will hit the, uh, the media press because it's a big deal what they have come up with. Um, 
And so she's going to be speaking to beavers in wildfire. And I think I neglected to say that Chris is talking about beavers and fish survival. So we have three incredible speakers. And you may wonder, gee, Dave, how did you get such good speakers? Well, the truth is I didn't. Um, when um, Mayor's Peak group, we, as a uh, group, we decided we we're going to do something on beavers. Um, I knew that I didn't know enough about it. I knew almost nothing. So I turned to my good friends, Randy and Pam Comalio, who are our local heroes in, um, in, in beaver activities. And I said, who would you get? And so every person we have here is somebody that they chose. Thank you, Randy and Pam. Now, um, as uh, Pani said, um, you'll have a lot of questions um, and you'll have a chance after all three speakers, but don't put any, please don't put anything in chat, put them in the Q&A and Bonnie will take care of them and then she'll recite the questions at the end. So thank you for doing that. And now I'm, we're on to Suzanne Foudy, hydrologist. Take it away. Okay, all right, I'm on. All right, um, can everyone see my screen? Okay, yes. I wanna thank you all for letting me be here. So as uh, Dave said, I'm gonna focus on water availability and water quality. And as I go through my presentation, I like to think of this presentation really beginning to develop and point out the partnership that we have with beavers. And so I always tend to think of this as a partnership with the wild. Beavers being just one example of incredible partners that await us as we as we address this um, major climate change and biodiversity crisis. So let's get started. So we are in trouble. The earth is getting hotter. Snowpack, which was our water reservoir in the past, is changing in terms of the timing of melt and the amount. And the result is an increasingly unpredictable yearly water paycheck. And we see this in the fact that our reservoirs do not fill in the spring. We see this in our low stream flows. We see this in our increasing stream temperatures. Impact of this unpredictability that's becoming increasingly more common has a huge impact on human communities. It also has a huge impact on wild communities. And here's an example of where increased water temperature which is a water quality issue, has resulted in fish dying. As water availability decreases and water quality declines, what we are going to be seeing and what we're seeing now is increases in human water conflicts because this is an essential resource and, it's, and the fact that it's declining is resulting in bringing groups with differing needs into direct conflict. This is the result of highly degraded stream systems as a result of human land use. And beaver can help us begin to restore those systems. So this is our new reality. This looks at the percentage of Oregon in moderate to extreme drought over the last seven years, from late June to late September. And what you'll notice is that four out of the seven years, 75% um, of the state or more is in moderate to extreme drought. What this means is that we have communities that are experiencing drought year after year after year. So not only is this having a cumulative effect on the flows into the reservoirs and in the stream flows, but it is causing the uplands to become increasingly dry and therefore much more sensitive to wildfire. Here is current condition. 80% of the state right now is in moderate to exceptional drought. And we can anticipate that we are highly likely to have more wildfire. So given that that is becoming our new norm, and the fact that the yearly water check, water paycheck is becoming increasingly unpredictable, it's time to rethink things. It's time to create new water savings accounts and water quality improvement zones. And we have um, this marvelous being that we can partner with who can help us through the building of dams radically and rapidly change the condition of streams throughout Oregon and the West. And as a result, alter the water abundance and the water quality on our landscapes. So here's a beaver dam in on the Mount Hood. And when the dams are built, they immediately begin to back up water, ponds develop, the uh, 
the stream becomes reconnected to the valley floor. We get this wonderful process by which water begins to sink into the ground. The water table rises. We see an expansion of the riparian vegetation. And all of that is reflecting a storage of water. The pond continues to provide to the river, but at a much slower rate. And so what we have developing are water savings accounts. The Susie Creek, Nevada story is a, is a great way to see what is possible because Nevada is so dry. And when you look at this stream, you think, wow, nothing is possible here. It is over wide, the temperatures are high, there's little carbon sequestration, little to no habitat, water enters and leaves, and it provides for very few wild and human communities. So in 1991, the BLM and the ranchers came together and formed a partnership, you could say. They agreed that they needed to change livestock grazing management. And they changed it from season long to spring fall grazing. And what this did is it made it possible for the vegetation to grow during the summer months. And so we begin to see riparian vegetation expand, sedges and willows appear and trap sediment, the stream narrows, the bank stability goes up, carbon sequestration increases. Time scale of change is six years. The river move show in, show up in 2000. And they begin to build their dams and maintain their dams. They have their families. Those kits head off and build more dams. And Susie Creek begins to transform and move to the next step in which we see large amounts of water being temporarily stored behind ponds and in the ground. Huge increase in carbon sequestration and a vast increase in fish and wildlife habitat. This increase in um, uh, sequestration is above ground and below ground. And as we look at the uh, root mass on the far left slide, it's not just that the carbon sequestration has gone up, but as that organic matter goes up in the soil, so does the ability of the soil to hold water. So what we now have is systems that have been where the, the water holding capacity of the soil has been enhanced as a result of beaver activity. Let's take a look at these three snapshots and let's think in terms of time scales of recovery. So from 1991 to 2007, it is 16 years. Who would have thought in 91 that this is what it would look like 16 years later? 1997 to 2010 is uh, 2007 is 10 years later. What's exciting is that a lot of our streams on public lands um, where livestock are grazed are really in the 1997 condition. So what this tells us is that if beaver are allowed to move across the landscape and begin to build and maintain and have their families, which in turn build and maintain dams, that we can rapidly transform stream systems in Oregon and the water abundance in the landscape. Here's another example just to give another feel for just how fast things can change. Here's Maggie Creek in Elko, Nevada. And Nevada is a great place because it's so dry. So 1994, we have a single thread channel. We have very little riparian vegetation as expressed by the red that sort of borders the channel and in some of these um, old abandoned channels that are tapping into groundwater. 2006, things have changed. We have moved in and built dams. The expansion of the red zone is riparian vegetation. And what it's telling us is we have elevated water tables. So the amount of water in this system has dramatically gone up. The water savings account is huge at this point. Time scale of change, 12 years. That is all it took. Now in 2006, the availability of all this extra water may not have been as significant because the yearly paycheck was fairly normal in Elko during the summer. The following year, Elko was in a severe drought. It is during this period of drought that the value of this these 12 to 13 years in which the landscape has been recovering and water is being stored becomes really obvious. Fast forward six years, 2012. We're looking down at Maggie Creek. It's 28 miles of beaver created water rich habitat. Think about what it feels like to be in a landscape that is this dry and then to come across this abundance of water and habitat. It is huge for the human and wild communities that exist in this area. And it was particularly important in 2012 because Elko was in a moderate to extreme drought, depending on where you were. So if you relied on Maggie Creek, then you were in a much better position. 
what this tells us, what these examples tell us, is that the organ stream, even if they're highly damaged, can be transformed from water scarce to water abundant in less than 10 years, and in many cases, less than 10. So during the drought, the pond continues to give to the river, and as the pond levels decline, water moves in that has been stored in the ground and continues to feed the pond. The pond continues to feed the water and this incredible amount of storage, which is possible because the beaver dams have been built and maintained by beavers, continues to provide for the wild and human communities, even in the midst of drought. The power of beaver extends beyond just during drought. These damaged stream systems that we have have also resulted in times during um, high flow events or precipitation events, massive flooding. The reason is, is because the streams are so highly overwide and incised. And as a result, during high flow events in the headwaters, the water races down streams from all the systems and arrives in mass. This is a stream gauge that's, uh, and it shows a pretty standard uh, hydrograph. Rapid peaks indicate water moves into a system and then it rapidly leaves with very little storage left behind. This particular peak was a rain on snow event in the area where I live. But here's what Camp Creek, which is a tributary to the stream and upstream of that stream gauge, looks like most of the summer and into the fall. A little tiny stream in a much bigger channel. On the day of the rain on snow event, this is what the channel looked like the water had completely filled that large channel. But because it was so big, it did not spill out onto the valley floor. The water came in and it left and there was no storage. However, if beaver had been present in the landscape and in the stream, when that rain on snow event had happened, it would have encountered those beaver dams and those streams that were partly filled. And as a result, the water would, instead of heading straight downstream, would be forced onto the valley floors and begin to sink into the ground, providing uh, water, uh, contributing to the groundwater that was being stored and the water savings account, and then it would slowly move downstream. The result is a change in the hydrograph, from this very sharp rise and fall to a much broader uh, flood peak and a much lower flood peak. And as a result of all that water storage, contributions, to the summer base flows. So how does that influence water quality? This increase in water that's in storage and this dampening of the big flood peaks. I'm gonna focus only on, on stream temperature because we have a lot of data for that in the state. So we have over 300 miles of streams in the state. We have over 290,000 miles of uh, streams that are fourth order or less. And these are important streams because of the size that beaver dams can build on. Of these, we have 120, over 128,000 streams that have some data on water quality. Some of these have data on stream temperature. According to ODFNW, what they estimate is they have, based on the data that they have, at least 78,000 miles of streams that are too warm. And remember, not all the streams have temperature data. So this is a minimum amount. Well, let's take a close up look at the North Fork River watershed because it's area I know well and have collected data. It's over in Eastern Oregon, which is dry. So the green represents national forest, the white public private land. The yellow dots are the location of stream temperature monitoring sites on the main stem. The red dot is the location of temperature monitoring sites in Lower Trout Creek, which is a beaver dam controlled reach. So how hot is hot? Temperatures on the North Fork um, over the last seven years have repeatedly been in the high 70s to high 80s consistently. That's hot when you think that the temperature standard is 68 degrees. Here is what the beaver dam controlled reach looks like on Trout Creek. The beaver were reintroduced in 1992 in this area and from 2000 and on in the field notes, there are active dams or inactive but intact beaver dams in this section year round. So they are maintaining the elevated water levels. This is what another tributary in the watershed looks like, and it is not influenced by beaver dams and has a very different look. It's really exciting 
and this is the power of data, is that the section of Beaver, the Beaver Dam controlled reach is less than 500 linear feet. So Trout Creek 5 captures temperature as it comes off private ground onto national forests. Trout Creek 1 captures temperature at the lower end of the Beaver Dam reach. And North Fork Burnt River 2 captures temperatures as it comes, the river comes off um, Whitney Valley. On July 15th, 2017, the maximum temperature on the North Fork was 82 degrees. The maximum temperature in Trout Creek was 77.9. However, the maximum temperature at the lower end of the Beaver Dam controlled reach was six degrees cooler. Imagine this happening all over Oregon and all over the West, and what that would mean in terms of improvements in water quality. Why are the stream temperatures so much cooler in the Beaver Dam reach? Ponded water is deeper. Long wave and short wave radiation, which heat the water, only go so deep. So a portion of the water column stays cooler. The lush vegetation on the area adjacent to the, to the pond shades the ground and keeps the near surface groundwater cooler. And that cooler groundwater moves into the stream and contributes to dampening temperatures. Let's look now at how that dam has influenced what has happened on Trout Creek over time. So we're gonna look at these three sites, North Fork Burnt River Three, upstream of Whitney Valley, North Fork Burnt River Two, downstream of Whitney Valley, this Whitney Valley has no shade. It's wide, the stream is wide and shallow and deeply incised. And then Trout Creek one. So summer maximum temperatures um, for, uh, for the two sites on um, the North Fork are high 70s to high 80s. When we look at Trout Creek, what we see is that in the early years, Trout Creek is also warm. But we just see that after and around 2008, there begins to be a change in the relationship of Trout Creek to the other two sites. What's happening is the hydrology of the Beaver Dam Reach is finally exerting its influence on stream temperatures, and the temperatures are declining. If you look at the degrees in which the maximum stream temperatures exceed 68 degrees, we're seeing greater than five degrees to getting close to 20 degrees hotter on the two North Fork sites. When we look at the Cloud Creek site, what we see again is this dramatic decline in, how, in the temperatures, and so decline in how much hotter it is. What I want to point out for a moment is this whole aspect of North Fork 3 and North Fork 2, above and below Whitney Valley. What's really important is that temperatures below Whitney Valley are always warmer. What this tells us is that if we're going to restore water quality, Private and public lands are both really important. Finally, let's take a look at the number of days that the stream temperatures exceed 68 degrees. On the North Fork Burnt River sites, what we're seeing between 50 and 80 days are exceeding the temperature standard. We see a dramatic decline in the number of days on Trout Creek. And this is directly related to the fact that those beaver dams and those elevated water tables and that shaded ground is having an influence and keeping those stream temperatures, or actually suppressing those stream temperatures as it flows through this reef. I mentioned that the uplands are also drying out. And so these beaver dam complexes become really important in protecting water quality and maintaining water storage capability post fire. And they do this because as the hillsides begin to erode, trap sediment and other pollutants coming off the hillsides and they maintain beaver the stream um, bank integrity channels stay intact floodplain and the stream system connections are maintained and the flood magnitudes are kept low and the water savings accounts are replenished during fire during flooding so these are major contributions that beaver make to our well-being and to the well-being of countless fish and wildlife so what's our contribution we need to reduce our personal carbon footprint. For those of us who fly, whether for fun or for conferences, this is an area that we need to start reconsidering. So that carbon sequestration that's taking place in those wetlands is given uh, so that we can contribute to by not putting more into the air. We can take these proactive approaches, coexistence, um, to minimizing human conflict so we maintain benefits on the landscape, and we can end beaver trapping and hunting in Oregon. 
because obviously dead beavers cannot build and maintain dams and dead beavers cannot have kits that go on to build more dams and restore more habitat. This is the current state of beaver trapping in Oregon. The blue areas are closed to trapping, every place else is open. So we clearly have a lot of areas where beaver could use some assist and be allowed to expand and begin to do their water quality and water availability benefit. Is there precedent for closing the state? The answer is yes. The state has been closed twice before by the state legislature for water and habitat resource reasons. Given the magnitude of the climate change and biodiversity crisis, there's all the more reason to take a very active approach in tackling this challenge. So to conclude, here we are in current condition. Beaver are being trapped. We have streams that are not functioning. Water quality is poor. We have conflicts that are rising. I hope that I've conveyed to you the potential about what beaver can provide for us, provided we are willing to be able to give them a chance. So if we want these benefits on the right, high quality water, water storage, water protection zones, homes for fish and wildlife, a decline in water conflicts, then we must make a choice about whether or not we're gonna continue with beaver trapping. I wanna, I wanna conclude with one thing. These are all tangible benefits that beaver provide to us. But I want to say that there is an intangible benefit that if we make this choice to allow beaver to do their water habitat and um, restoration activity, that they will give us, and it is intangible. And that is, we exist right now at a time when there is very little hope. And what beaver and a decision to allow them to expand and support them in that expansion will give us is the possibility of a new future and hope. And with that, I turn it over to Chris Jordan. Okay, I'm hoping that people can see my screen. Looks good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Suzanne, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, this is gonna be a hard act to follow. Um, I would like to talk with you this evening um, about beaver and fish. But before we talk about fish, let's talk about riverscape health. Uh, clearly, um, we have negatively impacted our, our, our streams and rivers and floodplains, our, our riverscapes, um, through our land management practices, um, through urbanization, uh, through overallocation of water and simplification of channels that, that result in these incised, disconnected uh, streams that are common all across the West and, and were well uh, demonstrated in those time series of, of recovery um, that Suzanne just showed you. So what I'd like to do before we start digging into what's the value of them is I'd like you to do this exercise. I'd like you to close your eyes and, well, how about your mind's eye so that you can actually watch the pictures, but close your mind's eye and imagine what a healthy stream system looks like. I just showed you some pictures of clearly unhealthy riverscapes. So what do you see when you envision a, a healthy riverscape? Um, is it something like this? Uh, I mean, if if this is what you saw, I think you need to work on your imagination a bit. Um, and while this, a system like this is common and is in better shape than the examples that I showed before, is this really as good as it gets? I, I would argue that this is biologically no better, not much better than those other systems, even though it might look good. It's time for us to reimagine what riverscapes really can be. What does a healthy connected floodplain really look like? What did these what did these riverscapes look like before? Before our 
disruption, our co-option of the floodplains, our simplifications of these systems. And can we get these riverscapes to look like this again? Can we make creeks and rivers look like wetland corridors? These pictures, these are pictures of, of, of healthy riverscapes. I'm going to assert they're healthy. Um, and you might ask, you know, what does it mean to be healthy? What's the difference functionally between a system like this and a system like this? And, and why can't we necessarily see it? Because if we can see it and we can understand it, then we can ask you know, restoration practitioners to build it. We can ask uh, the regulatory world to try to ensure that that's what rivers and streams and floodplains look like. But we can't get there if we can't imagine it, we can't see it. So what constitutes a healthy riverscape? What are the ingredients? What are the components of a healthy riverscape? There's, there's three. One is space. Streams need space. They need to be able to use the entire valley floor. The entire valley floor should be occupied by the stream, either by the stream channel or by vegetation and ground that's strongly influenced by all that water there. In that space, there needs to be complexity. Complexity in the channel. Here's a beaver dam right here. This piece of complexity in the channel is forcing all of this structure in the stream upstream of that structure. Those structural elements have different roles in different places in this wide unconstrained valley or this constrained tributary coming in. And the structure can be different kinds of elements. It can be vegetation, it can be beaver dams, it can be uh, substrate, it can be margins of the, of, of the valley but that structure itself is a necessary component. And the last critical component, and Suzanne talked about this, is the inefficiency of flow. You need flow to be a river, take the water away, it's not a stream or a river anymore. But a healthy river system is an inefficient conveyor of water. It's not a ditch. That water sticks around and does all of those things that Suzanne was talking about. floodplains are biofluvial geomorphic systems. They depend on the biology, the bio part. That's the plants and animals. That's the vegetation that makes up the stream beds. That's the beaver building uh, dams in the system. That's trees growing and falling into the system. They're fluvial. They depend on the flowing water. That's what does the work to move things around. They're geo. That's the sediment that's on the bottom or in the banks. That's what makes up the inorganic parts of this system. Together, they form the shape, the morph, and they really are systems. All of these pieces have to go together. Any one of those falls apart. Any one of those uh, components of its health, its, its space, its structure, or its flow, the biology, or the geology, and this is no longer a functioning system. So, so what's missing? What's missing from unhealthy riverscapes? How did we go from these healthy systems to, to unhealthy systems? In most cases, the biggest missing piece of those three, of the flow, of the space, and the structure, is, is that structure. It's that loss of hydraulic roughness and structural complexity that results in the simplification. Because remember, that structure drives complexity. That complexity can be beaver dams. It can be wood in the form of trees falling into the stream. But absent that complexity, systems simplify and fall apart. And they lose their biological and physical value. So let's just look at that a little bit. How does a floodplain change with dams? Here's an overlay of a, of, of a couple of um, graphics on top of a picture of a nicely connected floodplain. This is Birch Creek in, in the very southeast corner of Idaho. Here is the creek in this light blue line before complexity elements were added in the form of beaver dams, where these red dashed lines are, are beaver dams. 
Now that the beaver have come in and added structure that forces complexity, the yellow lines are now the margins of the stream. So going from the blue to the yellow uses the same flow, uses the same space, but that structural elements force the stream, force the physics of the water to expand laterally and vertically and be able to take advantage of all of that space. So that's an example of how these things go together. Okay, if we understand it, at least at that level, can we cause this change to happen where and when we want? Because we have a lot of these blue streams and we want are these yellow valley bottom engaged streams. So can we do this ourselves or do we just have to wait for beaver and all of the policy changes that Suzanne talked about to get beaver back on our landscapes? Let me show you some pictures from an experiment we did where we tried to push a system that's simple. Here's a simplified system before in 2005. And here's a complexified system with more than 200% increase in the inundation. That's the, that's the standing water in the summer. The side channel, the complexity increased by a thousand percent. That was driven by a change in structure. In 2009, we came in and added some beaver dam analog, some mimics of beaver dams to try to change the physics and try to encourage beaver to come in and take over. And they did. And, and in, in five or six short years, went from tens of dams to hundreds of dams in the system. And that turned this stream and turns any stream into a fish factory, into a climate change mitigation and adaptation structure. How? So let's dig into the how a little bit. Clearly, the water surface expands. So the upper part of this panel is um, just tracing where there is water. Uh, in 2005 and 2010 and 2014, in an area with beaver dams that were coming in at that time, in an area where beaver never really invaded until the very end. And you can see that expression of water on the surface, just as we saw in the Birch Creek example, expands from the water is only in the channel. Some dams come in, beaver and uh, beaver dam mimics come in, start to spread the water out. The water spreads out, engages with more area, uh, more beaver activity um, comes in because there's more vegetation and the water ex expands laterally. This is not because these years were good water years because their control area showed really no change in, in this stream without beaver activity, they started to show up towards the end. So water moves to different places with that structural add addition of structural complexity. Water moves sediment around with that addition of structural complexity. So here is a, a picture of a stream where what we're showing in the stream is where are sediment, um, different sizes of sediment that's sorted on the bed of the stream. So the color areas are the wetted area of the stream as well as what's the shape? Is it, a, is it convex or concave? Is it a pool or is it a bar or a riffle? And if we quantify those into different flavors, this is, the, this is the signature. This is like the fingerprint of this reach. After we add complexity, in this case, pieces of wood that mimic um, trees falling in as well as beaver dams, that signature changes. And the kind of complexity that's added are features that are biologically important for things like fish. There are more pools. There are more mid-channel bars and riffles. This is fish rearing and spawning habitat. There's more transition habitat, that is seams between these kinds of uh, features on, in, the, in the stream. That's fish feeding habitat. So in making and changing the physics of where the water goes because there's structural complexity, we're changing the amount and the quality of fish habitat. You can clearly see from space, and Emily is going to talk about this, that when you push water out laterally, you change the vegetation. You change from before, this is sagebrush, this is xeric vegetation that shows up red in these false color images, transitions to green or mesic vegetation like willows. That's where the water is. And so the vegetation, you're changing the plant habitat. And different plants provide different amounts of input into the streams, which becomes fish food. Suzanne's already showed you some examples of water storage across the surface of the 
floodplain that's affected by structural complexity like beaver dams. In this experiment, we put in monitoring wells and we quantified the amount of water, the change in that groundwater elevation. In the untreated areas, the groundwater elevation stayed about, uh, you know, stayed at about, uh, you know, 25 centimeters or so. In the treated areas, we added another 25 centimeters across the entire floodplain of water stored under underground. When that water is stored underground, it interacts with the substrate that's underground. And that substrate is, is very different temperature from the surface of the earth that's heated and cooled by the sun um, every day. And so if you ask what's the water temperature impact on a very fine scale, Suzanne showed you examples on a large scale, on a very fine scale, you can see the impact of water pushing from the surface into stored and returning. And there's the key part is that water comes back out of the shallow groundwater storage. Here's a, here's a reach in this experiment area where there are no structural complexity elements and it's just a run. And here are our are, are, uh, 10 temperature loggers placed very close together. And over a few days in the summer, they sh all show the same temperature trace. It's cool at night, it warms up in the day, it's cool at night, it's warms up in the day. And no matter where you are in this area, it's the stream, same water temperature. A very different situation results, a very different story is told when you're in the same spatial extent, just tens of meters, and there are beaver dams. These purple dots are where there are beaver dams. And as a result of water moving here from the right to the left across this, the water gets piled up behind the dams. In some cases, it spills over the dam. In some cases, it spills into the, into the ground and pops up later. And you can see that in looking at what's the temperature at all these red dots. Some of them track each other very well, warm in the day, cool at night. One of them stays at groundwater temperature, even though it's above the ground. It's not below ground. It's in the channel at 11 degrees Celsius constantly throughout these hot days in the summer. And other locations are a mixture, a mixture of the surface water temperature and the groundwater temperature. So at a fine scale, here's the mechanism by which structural complexity changes where water goes. And in order for water to do that, it takes these different paths and it takes different amount of time to move from, from right to left across these figures. And when it does that, it goes through different biological, it is allowed to go through different biological processes. And, and, and stream ecologists talk about the, the spiraling as how quickly um, nutrients can, can be cycled and where in space and time that process is happening. In this, un, in this simplified reach, very quickly the water moves from right to left. And if some biological processing is happening, it's in, in the time it takes to go through one cycle, the water particle is moved a long distance. When you slow the water down, when you make that inefficient conveyance out of a floodplain, as the water particle moves and some biological process is happening, it happens in a shorter distance in space because the water is moving more slowly. Those nutrient cycles are the basis of a food chain. The more nutrient cycles that happen, the more productive this entire system can be. That's the basis of why these systems are more, more productive biologically. They're more productive physically. They're offering different uh, temperature regimes for fish. They're offering different uh, physical locations for fish to hide. They're offering locations for different fish biological processes like spawning and rearing to happen. The complexity exists that supports the complexity of the needs of a life cycle of animals. That complexity doesn't exist in the simplified system. These systems are while they might look good, they are more like biological deserts than the, than the, the rich complexity of a connected floodplain. So I said I would talk about fish. But before I talk about fish, I'm gonna talk about climate change. Only just a little bit, just to point people to um, the, the paper that Emily and I recently um, wrote that argues that the North American freshwater climate plan, claim, plan is, is, is really nothing more than letting beaver go back and do what they know best, just as Suzanne was arguing. 
And all of those features of connected floodplains that are driven by beaver behavior are also climate mitigation and climate adaptation features. So it's a great three for one deal by letting beaver take over. So back to fish. So in this restoration experiment, um, which was in the John Day uh, uh, River in central Oregon, over a 30 kilometer reach, we did this treatment of adding structural complexity and encouraging beaver to add more structural complexity. And all the while we were counting fish and seeing we could find the same fish season after season, which gave us an estimate of its survival. And we did that before we started the treatment and after we did the treatment. And as a result of making these fish factories that I'm calling them, these complex flood connected floodplains, we saw a huge change in abundance and survival, in this case of juvenile Oncorhynchus micus, red band trout that sometimes become steelhead and go to the ocean. So how to read this complicated figure? On the left, before the restoration, the blue boxes are abundance in fish per 100 meters um, in the treatment area, and the control area is in red. And after the, the treatment, we also looked at the control watershed, but asked how did our treatment watershed change? So blue is less than red before, blue is more than red after. And so we've made more, almost 200% more um, juvenile fish per unit length in these streams. We've made more habitat, but actually made better habitat. It's not just more, and you know that it's better because the survival increases as well. In this case, survival in Bridge Creek was much less than our control watershed, which was um, Murderer's Creek in an, an adjacent part of the John Day. And this is seasonal survival. What percent of the fish survive over a four month period? Around half in Bridge Creek every four months um, and, and closer to uh, uh, 80% um, in the control watershed. After the restoration, the quality of the habitat in our treatment watershed was as good as our as our um, nice condition habitat in Murders Creek. So we increased the survival by 50%. And that's an indication of increasing the quality of the habitat. Some people argue that beaver dams are, are not fish friendly because they block the, the ability of fish to move up and downstream. That's just ridiculous because the fish and beaver have been living in the same place for thousands to millions of years, but people are still worried about it. So we, as well as lots of other people have collected data to show that that's in fact ridiculous. Um, and we did that by tagging thousands of, of fish in this watershed, detecting them as they moved. Here's the main stem John Day, and these are adult steelhead coming back from the ocean, spawning throughout the treatment area of our watershed and going up above the town of Mitchell into the, the national forest to spawn. So. Before we started doing the restoration in 2009, there were about 20 beaver dams in this watershed. 17% of the adult returning steelhead passed all of these beaver dams, passed our whole experiment and went up into the mountains. If when we do this experiment and we add more beaver dams, because you've already seen that data, this number, if it's a problem, should get smaller. The fish can't get through there. So eight years later, there are many, many more dams. And big surprise, fish did not have a problem with the beaver dam. And in fact, a larger percentage of them passed a larger number of dams to head up into the uh, higher parts of the watershed to spawn. So nice confirmation of something that we should have known all along, beaver dams are not a problem for fish. In fact, beaver dams make good fish habitat and there are more fish and fish survive better. In this case, the steelhead, in the presence of beaver dams. So if you need more uh, beaver stuff, more information about beaver, here are a couple of organizations um, that will get you connected. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, hopefully you all can hear me now and see my screen. What I'm going to be talking to you about is beavers and wildfire, and I affectionately call this talk Smokey the Beaver. And we're going to walk through how beavers are helping us build landscape scale climate resilience. 
So let's start by taking just a little bit of a step back. Um, beavers and wildfire, right? Maybe not something you've thought about before. Maybe it's kind of like, hmm, you know, I know about beavers and I know about wildfires, but you know, beaver, small animal ish, wildfire, huge landscape scale process. How do these things actually go together? So we're gonna take a step back first and just talk about the fact that beavers are nature's engineer. Now I'm pretty certain y'all have gotten the gist of this by now, being that this is the third part of this webinar series and the previous two presenters set me up excellently for this talk. But I'm gonna recap it just briefly anyways. A lot of our streams in the American West are degraded. They are simple, single channels, that riparian zone, that creekside ecosystem around them is tiny, it's not thriving, it's not resilient to any kind of a disturbance. But luckily, there's this animal that sees that as no problem, it's fine, and that's the beaver. So when a beaver comes in and it comes to a stream like this, it's like, all right, not ideal, but millions of years of evolution have made it so that I can deal with this. And that's exactly what it does. It starts building a dam. And when it builds that dam, that kickstarts these processes that help broaden out that riparian zone. You start slowing the water down, you start creating a little bit of a pond, it starts just seeping into the soil a tad, and in doing so, you know, you're starting to develop the slower water system. And that's great for the beaver. But busy as a beaver is a phrase for a reason. It's not just a funny joke. It is based on their behavior and their ecology. When beavers get to this stage, they don't stop building. They keep working on that dam. They make it bigger, they make it longer, they make it taller, and they make it stronger. And in doing so, it slows down that water even more. Instead of just a little pond, you now have a larger pond. And instead of just a little riparian corridor, you start to expand into a full wetland. And now the beaver isn't just doing this because it likes work and it's a glutton for pain. Beavers are doing this because they are so awkward on land. I don't know how many of you have seen a beaver out on the land, um, but this is a mammal that is somewhere between 40 and up to 100 pounds. It's pretty round. It's got webbed back feet, um, little grabby hands, and this huge paddle tail. And you imagine that walking out on solid land, and it is just absolutely ridiculous. Easy pickings for predators. This is like a big old chicken nugget waddling through the landscape. So that's not good for the beaver. And it knows that somewhere deep down in its biology. And so when it's building this pond, what it's doing is creating safe habitat for itself. Because when a beaver gets in the water, it's a completely different story. Instead of being this huge awkward mammal, they are so sleek and slick and agile and they can honestly outswim pretty much any predator they have in North America. And so knowing this, you know, beaver has to continue going out into the landscape, chewing down trees, getting food. So it starts to dig canals out too from its pond. It's not just okay with that little ponded area. It wants to be able to navigate the entire floodplain, that whole riparian corridor. And so it digs these little canals to be like water highways and they fill with that pond water. This is great for the beaver because now it has this fast track escape system and it can float logs home instead of trying to like hulk it over land. But it's also really great for the floodplain because these are effectively acting like drip irrigation lines. And if you were to walk up to a beaver dam in the field, maybe you'd see something like this. You've got that dam on the left-hand side and you've got that beaver lodge, separate structure that they live in, those little canals snaking out into the landscape. This artist did a great job of showing the on-land beavers as round and awkward and that underwater beaver looking really slick and agile. And you know, this is a big impact. This family of beavers has changed this landscape. But wildfire is bigger than this. Wildfire is not something a single family of beavers is gonna be able to make a meaningful difference in. But what if you think about them instead of from that single point field scale, you start thinking about them from above, from the landscape scale. We don't just have one beaver pond. A single family of beavers doesn't stop there. They don't just make their pond and their canals and be done. They keep building. And if you already look at satellite imagery day in and day out to find the beaver dams, you know exactly what you're looking at. And you're like, this is the coolest image ever. Um, and if you don't, that's okay, because I've highlighted some key features for you. So in yellow here, I've traced all of the beaver's dams. And you can see there's quite a few of them. And then highlighted in that bluish color, those are the canals that I can see from satellite imagery. So that's what those beavers have dug out, radiating out through the floodplain, acting like little drip irrigation lines. And there's a lot of them. And the caveat here is like having gone to these sites on the ground as well, there's at least two times, maybe five times as many canals out there that I just can't see at this resolution. And then circled in pink there, that's the beaver's lodge. So actually this is just one family of beavers maintaining this whole landscape. They're creating a huge amount of hydrologic complexity. It's not just that beavers build one dam and one pond and change things, they completely re-engineer the entire landscape. 
And now we're starting to get up to the scale where maybe they're gonna start affecting big processes like wildfire. And it's really important to think about the fact that they're not stopping water, but they are definitely slowing it down. So in the American West, a lot of our precipitation and our stream water comes in the winter, either as snow or as rain. And then as we get into the summertime, that's when the plants need it. That's when they have the most sunlight. That's when they're trying to do all their photosynthesis. And they also need water for that process. Now, a lot of times they start running out of water in the late summer and early fall. And that's when we get into this peak fire danger. So when we don't have beavers, you know, we get this big spike in our stream flow. I'm showing you a hydrograph. So this is just the amount of water coming through the stream at any point in the year. And when we get that big snow melt flow or that big rain coming through, you know, it's big, it's flashy, it's dramatic, and then it's gone. And it's not doing anything for the ecosystem anymore because it's already made its way out to the ocean. But when the beavers move in, they're slowing it down and they're smearing it out. And I used to say they were flattening the curve before this whole situation with COVID happened. And it's a real bummer it did because I need a new analogy. But that's truly what they've done is they've flattened this out, they've smooshed it down, they've smeared it out. So yes, there is less water coming through the stream during that typical flashy snowmelt period, but there's more water coming through the stream in the summer and in the fall when we're in that really critical time for wildfire. And if you think about those streams with and without beavers, um, but with depth now, thinking about what they're actually doing to the soil and the groundwater system, when we have infiltrating precipitation, when it's raining, it doesn't really matter because all of those plant roots are getting watered from above. Yes, the stream without beavers has a smaller impact on the groundwater system. Yes, in both situations, the water table is very deep. But as long as it's raining, it really doesn't matter where there are beavers. But as we've touched on today, it's not raining that much anymore. We're often in a period of drought, including right now, at least where I am. And when we have that drought, when we take away that infiltrating precipitation, suddenly only the plants that can reach groundwater or soil water can stay green. And in that stream without beavers, that's a really narrow band. Everything else is gonna start to wilt and shut down, go into the sort of dry, crinkly, golden state. But when we have those beavers, we have that beaver pond storing a huge amount of water. We have all of those beaver canals, which have also been moving that water further out into the landscape and sort of pinning the groundwater up to the surface, not letting it stay down way deep where the plants can't access it. And that's so, so important when you have one careless match uh, or power line or campfire, whatever it is. When you have a fire start in your landscape, it's going to take the path of least resistance. It's going to burn whatever is easiest for it. And in the stream without beavers, that's pretty much the whole riparian zone. That's all that floodplain. That's all of that landscape that really should be wet, but isn't because we're in drought and we've depleted groundwater and all these other things. But when we have the beavers, that's not what we see. We see them keeping it green because there's so much water that these leaves stay green and lush, and then they're just hard to burn. If I asked you to go start a campfire right now, you wouldn't go collect soggy sticks and leaves. That doesn't make any sense. It's the same concept here, except it's naturally occurring systems where the beaver ponds just happen to be absolutely full of soggy sticks and leaves. So this is like a wonderful thing for me to think about. And we've actually seen this too. It's not just a conceptual model. These photos, which are so famous, they've made it into every talk I see, um, not just my own, but many other people's. You've already seen them today, in fact. Um, we're taken by Joe Wheaton with Utah State University of the Sharps Fire in Idaho back in 2018. And what he showed really clearly was that on the streams that didn't have beavers, there was large scale burning in the floodplain and in the riparian zone. And in some places, the wildfire cruised straight through the bottom, burnt all the vegetation and completely obliterated that ecosystem. But where we had the beavers, it's a totally different story. There's just this bright band of green, the fires on either side of it burning the hill slopes, but it was not able to burn that beaver dammed area. And if you zoom in a little bit closer, you can really see the difference in the scale of burning here. So where we don't have those beavers on the left-hand side, there's these little white patches kind of sprinkled around the landscape. And what those are, those are ash piles. Um, so that's where we had willows and soil and all these other things previously that have burnt down to dust and it goes right up to the edge of the stream on both sides. There's nothing holding those banks together anymore. The roots are gone, the trees are gone. This is ripe for massive erosion afterwards in the first rain that comes. It's not a healthy system. But where we had beavers, you can see the beaver's dam. You can see these little canals snaking out into the floodplain. They're sort of reflecting the sunlight back at you in this image. And you can see how green it is around them. It just didn't burn, it was too wet. And so I'm seeing this and I'm like, wow, amazing. This obviously seems like a big deal, um, but where's the data? 
does this happen everywhere? Did this just happen at that one place in Idaho? Does this just happen in my brain when I come up with conceptual models? And being a scientist, instead of just pondering those things, I decided to actually study it and test it. And so I picked five wildfires that occurred throughout the Western United States. And at the time of this study, I did think they were big fires. I don't really think that anymore, and I'll come back to that. But they were all big-ish fires, and they all were in these different landscapes. Some were really rocky mountains, some were sort of pine forests, some were brushland, some were sort of scrubby. And they all had lots of beavers within them and lots of beaver ponds. And so my idea here is, all right, if we can see this effect, if we can see the beavers keeping things green, even during wildfires, in all these different landscapes, then it's a pretty generalizable effect. Like this happens everywhere, maybe. I don't know, it was time to test it. So I looked at these fires, and I want you to imagine that you go out to all of these different fires, and you go out the year before the fire happened, the year of the fire, so like while it's actively burning, and then right after the fire happened the following year. And so you're looking the year before, the year of, and the year after, and you walk along every single creek in my studies. And you're taking notes as you go, and you're like, all right, how green are the plants? Is there a beaver dam? Is there a beaver lodge? Is there a beaver canal? Is there any sign of beaver here? And you're asking yourself those questions as you walk, you're taking those notes on every single creek in the study. And that's basically what I did, except instead of going back in time and walking along these creeks, which is not possible yet, um, I used satellites. So I went back and looked at the data that was collected at that time and tried to figure out how green were the plants before, during, and after fire, and how does that relate to the positions of beaver dams. What I'm showing you here now is these creek profiles with the x-axis on the bottom being the distance you've walked along that creek from your starting point at zero to your stopping point out around 4,000. And then on the y-axis, that vertical one, that is NDVI, or Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which is basically how green are your plants. Um, lower number is less or fewer plants, higher number is more green plants. That dashed yellow line at point three, that is the threshold above which all riparian zones should be during the growing season. They should be green, at least 0.3 green. And if they're not that green, they are not healthy. Now the green curves on this plot are the year before and after the wildfire. And you can see they're both pretty generally above that 0.3 threshold. And then that brown curve is the year of the wildfire. And if you see, if for a while it's hanging out with those other two curves, and then it really plummets right around 1500 meters. And then it stays below that 0.3 threshold. And if you look at that, and then you look along that x-axis at the bottom, you see there's these little black dots. That's the positions of the beaver dams on this creek. And it corresponds almost perfectly with the places that were not affected by the fire, essentially. Those three curves are not statistically different from each other up until the point of 1,500 meters down creek. And then after that, they sure are. Um, it plummets during the fire. That is because those plants burned. To make this difference a little bit easier to visualize, I've taken the difference, and we are visualizing it. And so now what we're looking at is the fire effects. A lower number means it was less affected by the fire, and a higher number means it was more affected by the fire. Again, those beaver dams are marked by the little black boxes along the x-axis, which is how far along the creek we've walked. And you can see the beaver dams are really suppressing the fire effects. There's not a lot of effect of the fire for the first 1,500 meters or so, and then there is a lot of effect of the fire. And that was sort of that larger scale burning that we see happening um, in those places without beavers. And I didn't just see this on one creek. I saw this on all the creeks. This was consistent, repeatable, and reliable. Overall, I found that these areas with beavers were three times more protected from wildfire than areas without beavers. All riparian zones, all creeks, it's not like I'm comparing hill slopes to rivers. This is river to river. Does it have beavers or not? And we're seeing threefold protection in fire. And I like to say, you know, this is a cool effect. Who can benefit? Well, one person or a thing that can benefit is other animals. And we've observed this. This black bear is hanging out in that beaver pond that's on the left that didn't burn. And when I saw this photo, I was just so jazzed because it was the perfect setup for me to say, it looks like Smokey Bear got a little helping hand from Smokey the beaver. Um, but really what's happening here is these beavers are creating these patches of fire refugia. And these are places where plants and animals can go and not burn during our catastrophic wildfires, which is really important. And so I, I do this study and I'm like, all right, it's solved. This is great. I'm happy beavers are going to sort of save the world. But then I have to take a step back because we are now in the age of megafires. And that's a whole different ballgame. Megafires are a fire that is larger than 100,000 acres. And just being a big fire doesn't make it a bad fire. And a lot of fires are not bad fires. Most of the West does need fire in the ecosystem. 
but a lot of megafires get to be the size that they are because they're exhibiting really extreme behavior. They're making their own weather systems like pyrocumulus and pyrocumulonimbus clouds, which spew ember and ash, create fire tornadoes and fire storms, and result in these just absolutely explosive spread rates, of like 100,000 acres in a day, leaving behind in their wake just massive swaths of moderate and severe burning. And that's not a good fire. And unfortunately, that's the fire we've had the last couple of years. And so thinking about this fire trajectory, I wanted to just check in and see, all right, well, these beaver created fire refugia. Do they stick around during mega fires too? Can beavers you know, keep protecting even this really extreme event? Or is it just limited to sort of your more run-of-the-mill standard wildfire? To answer that question, I looked at two huge mega fires, um, 200,000 acres each, that Colorado had in 2020. This was a really interesting case study because Colorado had not had megafires for like the last hundred years, and then suddenly they had two in 2020, and they were severe. The maps I'm showing you here are the burn severity maps, um, and the yellow and red indicates moderate and severe burning, respectively. So you can see these are not casual chill fires. They were very destructive, um, and they also had a lot of beavers in them. Cameron Peak Fire had 99 satellite visible beaver dams, and the East Troublesome Fire had 512. So quite a few beaver dams in here, a lot of severe fire behavior, the perfect place to see can these fire refugia patches persist even during megafire. I couldn't use NDVI again, because apparently places that are not coastal California have seasons and Colorado's included in that. And so these fires were burning into autumn and winter and the plants were already changing colors due to the seasons. So it's harder to just look at that plant greenness to see how the fire effect was um, sort of impacting this landscape. So instead of that, I went through and I used false color mapping. What I'm showing you is true color mapping. So this is looking at an image that's very similar to how our eyes would assemble different bands of light. Um, it looks familiar, the trees are green, the rocks are brownish beige, um, but you can't really see patterns, uh, especially fire patterns in this because everything's really dark. And so when you use satellite imagery, what you can do is reassemble those bands of light differently so that the different patterns of landscape change pop out. And one of my favorite ones is false color. And in just standard false color imagery, burn scars show up as dark black or brown, and then vegetation shows up as red. That darker red vegetation is usually trees, and then that lighter red vegetation is more herby stuff. You can also use false color urban, which is another permutation of this, in which you can actually see the hot spots too. And so now in that top corner where the fire is actually burning, I can see where it's active and the places that have already burned. So instead of that NDVI profiling like before, this time I'm just going through the fires and seeing, all right, here's a beaver dam. Did it burn or not in this fire? And I go through and I do this in all these different patches and all of these different creeks in both of these fires. I mean, there was 99 beaver dams in Cameron Peak, 512 in East Troublesome. We checked them all. We checked them with satellites and we also checked a bunch of them on ground. And what we saw was that these fire refugia were persisting. They were sticking around even during mega fires visited this beaver pond, and just like what we saw in the satellite data, the area around the pond is totally fine. It's green, there's mature vegetation, there's otters hanging out on the beaver dam. I mean, if you don't look too much at the hill slopes, you wouldn't even know that this was in one of Colorado's most severe wildfires in the last century. Unless, of course, you look downstream a little bit or up at the hill slopes, and then you see the scale of burning that actually occurred. If this was a severe wildfire, it was not trivial, it did not sort of treat this landscape lightly, it was burning everything that it could very close to the beaver ponds. I mean, just outside of that complex, we saw the willows burnt down to these little toothpicks and all the trees were absolutely crispy, not coming back to life. But in the beaver pond, it was fine. And what really stuck out to me was that gradient that you could see just looking out across the landscape. When we're by the beaver pond, we've got these three stories of vegetation, pine trees, willows, and then grasses. And as you go to the right and you move away from the beaver complex, slowly you just lose that vegetation. You lose the willows, you lose the pines, you lose the needles. You go from a fully intact ecosystem down to absolute charcoal. And it happened over just a few hundred meters. So the beavers were able to suck all that power right out of the fire in not that much distance. It's truly remarkable. And overall, I mean, most of these beaver dams did maintain their fire refugia. We had a few that did not in Cameron Peak, and those ones were a little bit older drained ones, or they were really brand new isolated ones. But between both fires, it was like pretty consistent that those fire refugia were sticking around and that the beavers were creating that refugia at a rate of about 2.7 acres per beaver dam. 
Now in Cameron Peak, there were fewer dams, so they were kind of occurring in clumps, but in East Troublesome, there were more, so it was occurring more in ribbons, which to me start to look a little bit like fire breaks, but there's a lot more research needed on that topic. There are a lot of questions remaining. I don't want to pretend like this is a completely solved topic. It's not. We have lots of things that we want to know. So we opened the door to this whole list of new questions, which if you're like a slideshow screenshot or this is one for you, like what are the carbon savings from not burning that landscape? Wildfire is a huge emitter. How much are we saving by just not burning those acres? What kind of plants, animals, and people can actually make use of these fire refugia? Do mature ecosystems then go sort of reseed the rest of the landscape afterwards? Is this like preserving a nucleus of ecological recovery? How much ash and sediment can each beaver pond attenuate after the fire? Can we actually predict how much restoration we need to stop a fire in their tracks? And if we want to partner with beavers, how do we even do that? How do we get them back into these systems in a way that is successful and benefits the watershed, the beavers, and the people? Chris and I have talked a little bit about this in our recent paper, Beaver, the North American Freshwater Climate Action Plan. I encourage you to read it. Um, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And so this is my call to action. Everybody invest your time and efforts in these kinds of questions because they're important. And I just want to end by emphasizing this is not an anomaly. We saw this in California, these fire refugia. We've seen it in Canada, completely different landscape. Canada is not the same as California. We saw this in Idaho, we've seen it in Colorado, and we just saw it in Oregon this past year. And I really like this one in the bootleg fire because for a while, some people were saying like, oh, well, maybe it's just the shape of the landscape, it's a valley. Like, of course, the valley bottom is not gonna burn for whatever reason, even though that doesn't make sense to me. But if you look at this landscape, like this is flat. Um, this is not like a protected sheltered valley bottom. This is a pretty flat landscape. And even so, that beaver complex was staying green, Fire came right up to both sides. We got these little charcoal pencils on either side with the burned trees, but the beaver pond is fine and the ecosystem around it is fine. It's unburned, it's safe, it's preserved. Huge shout out to my research team. I talk about this stuff all the time, but it's definitely not a solo project. I work with tons of really great students and we've had tons of really great support from local nonprofits, local restaurants, and then larger organizations as well. So big thanks to them. Uh, and I know we're about to go into a panel discussion but if we don't get to one of your questions for me, just know you are welcome to email me or find me on Twitter, which is a nonstop stream of beaver science. So I will stop my screen share here and we will transition to the panel. Awesome, thank you so much, Emily. I wanna invite um, Chris and Suzanne to join us on screen and mute themselves. We do have a lot of questions. Um, I just wanna say, I have learned so much throughout this series. I, I really didn't know much at all about beavers. Um, and I'm, I'm just so impressed with um, how little I knew. So I've, I've learned so much from you guys and from our other events as well. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start with, we had two questions around trapping. So I wanted to start with that. Um, Annette asked, in the areas of Oregon where trapping isn't allowed, how did that come about? Who led the way? Was it a state or a local decision? Does anyone have thoughts? I can answer that. Um, actually, it appears to have occurred pretty early on. Uh, sometime after 1952, a lot of those closures take place in the 80s. Um, it, most likely, they were requests made by the National Forest. And Chris, if you have anything else, why? But I believe they were requests that I know that the Wellow Whitman closures were made officially by the, the forest, as was the Ochico, was an official request by the forest. And so that's largely how it was. Um, requests since then have been denied. Great. Thanks. Krista, do you want to add anything? No, that's great. I mean, it's, it's great. sad, as Suzanne said, that people don't remember why enough people have left and it, it's a it's an important decision that has been supported by the forests once they've put the closures in place but the initial rationale is is in the midst of time but i think these places have benefited by having uh reduced one source of uh artificial mortality on these animals mm -hmm. 
Sure. So then that might um, already answer this question, but I'll throw it out because it kind of has two components. Um, is an effort underway to ban trapping or otherwise killing beavers? If so, is there an aspect of the trapping ban which would address compensation for private landowners for the loss of commercially valuable property due to flooding? And I did also have another question just kind of about um, landowners and how they perceive the need for beavers. So we can maybe talk about that too. Okay, I'll start. <clears throat> um, there were a couple issues. There were a couple attempts, and John Malgram brought that, uh, that those up under the second set. Um, there was a request made to the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission in 2020 that um, did not go anywhere. There was another request to initiate rulemaking to the commission in 2020 in November, and that would have been sort of the big, broad discussion. And the commission also denied that. There was House Bill 2843 that went to the state legislature, and the goal was to close commercial and recreational beaver trapping, and at this point was to restrict it to federally managed public lands. The idea is that that's where a lot of the ideal stream sizes are, limited infrastructure, um, it's a place where a lot of the headwaters are. And so if you could improve water quality and water abundance coming off these public lands, there would be a huge benefit to downstream users. Um, House Bill 2843 um, never got a hearing or a work session, and so it died in committee. So as of now, there has been no change made to the trapping regulations and most of the state remains open. As far as the second question that has to do with private landowners, um, currently on private land, you can kill a beaver and you can take it whenever. You're not bound by the fur bear regulations. And so if there's an issue, you can address it immediately. Um, as John Melgram mentioned, there was another house bill that would have changed sort of getting a permit and required reporting, but that also failed. There's a lot of effort, in, and Jacob Shockey talked about this, this ability to work with landowners and find these non-lethal coexistence strategies that allow landowners to maintain the benefits of the elevated water table and the sub-irrigation and the habitat while um, minimizing the impacts of flooding. And this is something that Chris Jordan has worked really closely with in Jake with Jacob, where you know you build these pond levelers and it allows you to minimize conflicts. So um, currently private landowners can do what they need to do. Um, the goal is to minimize those conflicts and to find those coexistence strategies. Because if you don't and you take the beaver out, obviously they were there for a reason. And so another set is just going to come in. And so you end up with kind of this revolving door of beaver showing up and problems arising and you get rid of them and then another beaver shows up. And maybe it shows up in the middle of the night and when you wake up, your road is washed out. So there's beauty in keeping them there and working with them. And uh, Chris, you got anything else you want to add? Yeah, the one thing that's always surprising about this conversation is that there's a presumption that there's a necess necessity for compensation and uh, there's enormous damage um, that comes from having these animals on interacting with private landowners and their infrastructure. And, and that was actually one thing that Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife tried to address almost 20 years ago by commissioning a piece of, a really nice piece of social science um, work from the forestry department at OSU to ask the question by surveying private landowners across the state of Oregon who live on near water, so they're likely to encounter damage from of their property from beaver. Do would they need some incentive program? Uh, were uh, the state to change its regulations on on you know, lethal removal or lethal control? Because they imagine if they change that regulation, they would have even more problems. And the resounding answer was no. We're okay. We, the damage isn't that big a deal. Um, we don't need any uh, financial um, you know compensation. Uh, we'd like to have the animals around and we would rather that they didn't have a lethal, we'd rather that the lethal option wasn't the first choice. So when asked, this is what the people of Oregon say, when talked about rather than talked to, it's assumed that there needs to be lethal control as this as this tool. So, so I, I'm not, it, it is puzzling why the conversation goes immediately to a need for a lethal control when, when it's been posed to people who would, who, seem to be suffering are saying, no, it actually, it's not that bad. We realize the benefit and we're, and we're happy to have the animals around. Thank you. 
Um, another question, do beavers exist in most states of the United States? And are there efforts in other states to educate decision makers about the importance of beavers to climate mitigation? I can jump in. They are everywhere except Hawaii, um, for good reason. They shouldn't be out there. Um, but yeah, beavers are everywhere, east coast, west coast, mountains down to the coasts, like into the estuaries. They're in deserts, they're in forests, they're in shrubland, grassland, brushland, everywhere. They are a remarkable species because just like us, they can go into a hostile environment and make it their home. Um, so they are everywhere. A lot of states are working on these re-education efforts and trying to talk to people about what beavers do, what beavers don't do, and sort of the reality of working with them and living with them. There's still lots of sort of beaver myths out there, like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe has convinced far too many people that beavers eat fish, and they don't. Um, and you'll still hear very intelligent people say, like, I'm pretty sure I saw a beaver eating fish. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's an otter. Um, but understandable, you're far away, and you see this big brown mammal in the water eating a fish, especially because otters hang out in beaver ponds. And so it's like a connection is there, and they just don't know. Um, and so I think a lot of the education that I see going on around the West is, you know, there's some on sort of the policy and the permitting and that kind of stuff, but a lot of it's just, you know, what do beavers do? They've been gone for so long in a lot of these places that we don't remember what it looked like when they were here. We don't remember what they do and what's natural and what's not natural. And, you know, taking people out and showing them those sites is a really popular strategy. We do it down here in California a lot to just remind people what wetlands look like because they're so few and far between. Um, these kinds of webinars are a big effort across Western states to connect people with people who understand beavers or work with beavers to get those questions answered. Um, it's really cool. There's a lot going on. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. Um, Kim asks, what can we do to advocate for beaver recovery? Well, I'll take a shot at this. Um, the bottom line is, and I think I kind of let, ended with this, um, and I think that having seen Chris and Emily's presentations, is we don't get any of those benefits unless we have this robust beaver population on the landscape. And they have to be able to be there, and they have to be able to build and maintain dams. And given the uh, thousands and tens of thousands of miles across the West that are so damaged, you have to take the trapping pressure off, the human trapping predation pressure. They're still going to be taken out by cougars and wolves and coyotes, and they're still going to have their accidents. It's the only, it's the only mortality cause that we actually have an influence on. And so um, in terms of advocating, I would say start talking to your county commissioners. Um, there will probably be another attempt to um, bring this before the state legislature and to try to get um, a closure, at least a partial closure. Ideally, I'm beginning to realize that as climate change is accelerating, simply closing on federally managed public lands is probably not enough. Um, and when that happens, to be aware of it and to take the time to call your state representatives and, and really advocate for this as a water saving, fire you know, prevention, salmon recovery, um, honoring the, our tribal obligations, a lot of it's going to be about staying informed with the groups that will send out alerts and say, OK, we're going to make another push to ask for a closure, because that is really the only way we are going to get that expansion. And if we want those benefits, we actually have to give the beavers protection and the protection they need is actually from us. One thing I'd add on to that is if beavers are in your local community, if they are in your neighborhood, and someone's trying to make a management decision that is not productive, make a stink out of it. Um, that's been really effective in California when beavers move in, especially at the urban wildland interface, and they're next to ag land, they're next to houses, they're next to trails, um, they're totally changing waterways. If the community sort of rallies around that and says, hey, this is something we want in our neighborhoods, we want this in our waterways, we want to fish here, we want to hunt here, um, that kind of pressure has resulted in big policy changes here. And so, you know, stand up for the beavers. If you feel like you're being spoken about and not spoken to, like Chris was saying, like make your voice heard and talk about what you actually want. Because if enough people do, other people start to listen. Some of the best places to start, I mean, certainly through your watershed councils in Oregon, that's the sort of lead entity for, for engaging in, in watershed health at a local level. But the probably the biggest source of mortality are the is the proactive removal of beavers before they cause a damage with in public infrastructure, which is at the county public works. 
And, and I think a great example of the benefits of, of that engagement is right here in Benton County, the, the program that Randy Camilio and others started of working with the with the with public works about offering non-lethal alternatives so pond levelers and culvert fencing um you know is the coexistence and education so that the those potential for damage um is is cut off before uh it, it occurs and realizing that there's a possibility for sharing that floodplain some parts of it are occupied by beaver and beaver wetlands and other uh as opposed to trying and getting on that treadmill that Suzanne talked about of you have good beaver habitat, you remove an animal, and you know their relative is going to show up because it's still good beaver habitat. And so how to work with Oregon Department of Transportation, how to work with the county public works to institute programs where lethal removal is not the first option. I, I think I would like I'd like to make just one other point here is so currently there are about 100, less than 170 people in the state who trap on federally managed public lands. Um, and this is where I got to this question of what is our contribution to this climate challenge? So all of us are gonna need to bring something to the table. And this is where the trappers can begin to say, you know what, this animal is really valuable and I can see its benefits. And so, you know, I'm not gonna trap, that's a personal decision. I think this to me becomes really where those of us who don't trap also have to bring something to the table. And for me, that's where, you know, making decisions about do I fly or not? How do I re reduce my carbon input um, up footprint? Uh, doing something that I would like to do, but I'm making a choice not to do it because that's the contribution I can bring to the table. And so, uh, you know, I think that that's something that we all have to realize is that we're going to have to bring different elements to the to the table, and that we are all going to have to give up something we really enjoy doing if we basically want a future. And it's going to be different things for different groups of people. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. I mean, it is just after eight, and I think that was a really good question to end on. Great answers. Um, so thank you all for your time tonight. This is such a good presentation. Um, like I said, I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has as well. Um, and we'll just um, say farewell. Thank you so much for listening in. You will get a copy of this um, event recording emailed to you within about 24 hours. Everyone who registered for the event will. And it will also get posted and subtitled um, on our YouTube channel, the library's YouTube channel. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you all. Thank you. That was great.